Hello everyone, I'm John Mark Cox. And I'm Beverly Ross, and we are grateful you are watching. If you're local or close to Clarksville, we want to personally invite you to join us in person for worship. We hear from our guests often that they watch online, so if that's you, let this be a personal invitation to join us here at church. If you're an individual, a large family, military, we have something for everyone. Yes, we have something for everyone. We have connect groups from preschool through adults. Our connect hour starts at 9 a.m. Our worship service starts at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We would love to see you here in person. If you're not local and you're watching, we'd like to hear from you as well. Where are you watching from? Can we pray for you? Email us, type it in the chat. We want to be able to minister and respond to you. And our mission here is to worship God, love people, share Jesus, and make disciples. We want nothing more as a church staff than to serve His church. We also want to extend you the opportunity to partner with us in sharing the gospel through giving. You can give online right now by scanning this QR code or type the link fbct.org slash give in your web browser at any time. Today we continue in the sermon series, I Am, with a message on I Am the Way, the Truth, and the Life. But first, let's kick off worship as we sing, Open Up the Heavens.
Amen. That's a great way to begin worship today. We are thankful that you're here, guests in the room. We want to say thank you for being here at First Habs today. Those who worship with us online, we're thankful for you as well. And uh, so what you're going to find in front of you will be a guest card. And if you are a guest, we'd love you to fill that out. You can put it in your offering plate or you can take it to one of our Connect Centers out in the concourse after the service. We'll give you a gift. And we just want to say thank you for being here. Also, you're going to find some QR codes related to the bulletin, the Connect card, but also the giving. You can see those right there in front of you, too. But what a joy to welcome you to worship today. What a blessing just to ask the Lord to open up the heavens for what he's going to do here today as well. So let's turn around and greet each other at First Baptist Church today. While our church family is greeting each other, we just want to take another opportunity to say thank you for joining us online. For those that live in or near Clarksville, we'd love to invite you to worship with us in person on Sundays. We have connect groups for all ages that begin at 9 a.m. and worship at 10.30 a.m. If you don't know where to go or what to do, we've made it super easy for you. Just check out the link below and plan your visit today. We hope to see you soon. Well, thank you for doing that. I want to encourage you to find your place in God's Word this morning here in John chapter 14. Today we're talking about Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. So in your printed copy of God's Word or electronic device, you follow along this morning as I read, and then you'll be seated. And we're going to watch a video in just a moment. But John 14, beginning in verse 1, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You may be seated for a moment. One of the things that we desire here at First Baptist Church is to reach the nations with the gospel. But as we desire to reach the nations, we don't want to neglect our neighbors right here in our city. And so you're going to see a video in just a moment. One of our students, Katie Moncrief, who has been serving with our Good News Club at Burt Elementary. And so we appreciate seeing people of all ages be used. We had students today greeting people, opening doors. And so we appreciate all ages serving the Lord. But here's a difference our service makes in a local school walking distance from our campus. But watch this video. My name is Katie Moncrief, and I'm a student here at First Baptist. This past school year, I served with Burt Elementary Good News Club, and I saw God work in how many kids actually became Christians this school year. We saw a lot of kids begin their faith journey and the things we were able to teach them gave them a foundation for that, things that they can take with them the rest of their lives. Simple things just like how to memorize scripture, how to use their Bibles, what the character of God is and who Jesus is. No matter what kind of home they come from, they have a foundation for their faith because of what we've been able to teach them. And I also think it's important for students my age to serve because it equips us to serve God as we get older and also to share the gospel. We are the next generation of leaders, teachers, mentors, and parents. And serving is a great tool to equip us to do that. Serving as a student is also important because it allows us to support our churches and our communities. It takes the focus off of ourselves and allows us to see how God can use us as students. And it equips us in our local churches so that as we get older, we know what serving looks like in those areas. And ultimately, we're called to serve no matter what our age is. And seeing students serve is something that really encourages other people and hopefully encourages them to also join in serving. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for Katie and her family. And 
And uh, praise the Lord to see that generation serving the Lord. We appreciate, we pray for Cole and all those involved in Next Generation Ministries and Cheryl and Tabitha as well, all involved with them and their ministries. What a blessing to see God using that generation. So this morning, we're going to give tithes and offerings here in just in a few moments. And uh, we encourage you to be faithful as we desire to be faithful in giving because we'll never outgive the Lord. And he has blessed us as a church in so many ways. But today we're going to pray first. But Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 1 says, uh, do not be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. He said that to his disciples, but I wonder how many people in this room this morning, how many people watching somewhere around the world, you find yourself with a troubled heart today. What that word means is just don't be afraid. Don't be cowardly in your relationship with him. And so I want us to bow together as we pray this morning. And if there's trouble in your life and, and we can pray for you, I want to encourage you just to stand up where you are. You walk into worship this morning with a heavy heart, with a troubled heart, and you just want the Lord to minister to you today. So if that's you, I want to encourage you to stand to your feet where you are. And we want to pray for you today and just ask the Lord to bless you and give you encouragement and strength. Anyone in this room? People standing up all around. Here's the good news. He ministers to us at our point of need. Others who need to stand to your feet and just say, I just need the Lord's help. Anyone else? Jesus, we love you. Thank you for loving us. And Jesus, I thank you today when you said to your disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. That means to us as well. Thank you that we can bring our cares to you. We can bring every issue that we've got to you. And thank you that you're fully aware of everything that we're facing, everything that we're dealing with. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for being our best friend. And Jesus, thank you for being our healer as well. What a blessing it is to have a conversation with you today and to pray for those in the room who are standing to their feet and just saying, my heart is troubled, I have a need. It takes courage to be able to do that, transparency to be able to do that. But Lord, I pray for every person standing that you'll meet that person's need exactly as he or she needs you to. Pray for those who are watching wherever they may be at around the world who have needs as well. Maybe they're standing at their feet or maybe they're on their knees somewhere and they just need a touch from you, Lord, and I pray that they will experience your touch as well. But Lord Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in your church here at First Baptist. Thank you for what you're going to do today. Thank you for this message about Jesus that I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's not a popular message in the culture we live, but Lord, we're faithful to your word to be faithful to preach the whole counsel of Scripture, our desires to obey you. And Lord, I pray as we give tithes and offerings that you're going to bless those today as well to help us minister to people in our city as we have been able to see from the video, but also getting the gospel to the nations around the world. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you that you open up the heavens that we can experience you. And thank you, Lord, that we get to read the word and pray the word, but we can even sing the word as well. So, Father, I pray again for those who are standing, those with special needs in their lives today. May this be a day they walk away from this worship gathering and say, I met the Lord today. He touched me today. He changed my life today. And the glory will go to you. Thank you, Lord, as we continue to worship through tithes and offerings. We give you the praise. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all of us stand as we continue to worship through giving, but also singing God's word. And let's continue to lift up and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. Oh, you are my portion. Oh, you are my hiding place. I believe.
We have two weeks to go in this sermon series. That today we're focused on John chapter 14. So let me invite your attention to God's word and you find your place there in verse 1. And we're going to walk through this today from scripture. Here's what I've noticed in my own life the older I get, more things change. Can I get a witness? Anybody agree with that? The older you get in life, things change. I remember when I was younger, I loved to travel, still love to go on mission trips and do all that. But I love to travel. I love to uh, get my suitcase out and pack a suitcase. Uh, I love to go to the airport. I love to get on a plane. I love to land somewhere in a city and get a rental car and stay in a hotel and see the sights where we were at. Love doing that. But here's what I've discovered. The older I get, the more I just want to stay at home. Is that true for anybody? In John chapter 14, Jesus is going to talk about coming home. And he's going to trouble the disciples a little bit, but he's talking about coming home and I can't even begin to tell you the hundreds upon hundreds of hospital visits I've made in my pastoral ministry. And so I'd walk into a hospital room and have every desire to be a comforter to those whom I, were, I was visiting. 
And so when I'd walk into those hospital rooms, I wanted to be someone who would minister to those individuals and comfort them. But many times I walked away from those hospital rooms realizing I had been convicted and I had been challenged by the very patients whom I was there to see. Here's what I mean by that. So many of them, maybe at a, they were near the end of life, physical life, and here's what they desired. They desired to go home and to be with the Lord. Lord, why aren't you calling me to go home? Why am I still here? Why can't, Lord, you just take me? I'm ready to go. Let me come home and be with you and the loved ones and saints throughout the ages. Happened again and again. My grandmother, my grandmother was so influential in my life. She, she wasn't a, a super educated lady, but she had wisdom in her life. And she introduced me to playing golf. And so I appreciate my grandmother. She ran one of the pro shops for one of the state park courses in Kentucky. And so I'd, I'd go to work with her all the time, play free golf. You can't beat that deal. But uh, when I was growing up, we lived, we had some acreage and my grandmother lived across the road in some acreage. So I would hit golf balls from our yard to her yard and then from her yard back to our yard. I can't even begin to tell you how many times I hit her car, I hit her house and I broke out windows. But she never said to me, I want you to stop playing golf. She never did that even though there were dents in her car and, and there were places on the, on the house and then there were some windows that had to be replaced. But she was always supportive that way. But I remember her being in the hospital. She's nearing the end of her physical life. And so I'm in her room and I'm standing by her bed and I prayed with her. And after I prayed with her, here's what she looked up to me and she said, she says, I just want to go home. And when she said that, I knew my grandmother wasn't talking about her little house out in the country. She was talking about going home, being with the Lord. She was ready to go home, and she wanted to do that. I remember standing in an ICU room with my mother on that Saturday, and I knew her life was coming to a physical end. And I'm standing by her bedside. I've got my hand in her hand, and I say to my mom, I said, Mom, as much as I want you to stay here, you have been a fighter your entire life. I want you to go home to be with the Lord because, Mom, the best is yet to come for you. And here's what happened. In just a matter of moments, I saw her breathe her last physical breath, and she went home to be with the Lord. Let me ask you, do you, do you know that you're going to go home to be with the Lord? Do you even know how to go home and be with the Lord? That's what Jesus is teaching in John chapter 14. He said so clearly, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and many times we can be very critical of the disciples because when you look at the disciples, the followers of Christ, here's what we know about their lives. They were ordinary individuals. They were flawed in many ways, and many of the disciples were fishermen and tax collectors. And as you look at these men, you have to realize Jesus in John chapter 14 is going to talk to them about, about coming home. And it says, let not your hearts be troubled. They were troubled. That word again means not to be afraid, not to be cowardly. You have to realize also in John chapter 13, they didn't have chapter divisions like we have in our Bibles. So the text would have continued on. But in John chapter 13, in the upper room, Jesus is teaching his disciples. And what is he teaching them? He's saying, one of you is going to betray me. And then he said, there's going to be another view, specifically Peter is going to deny me. And then after Jesus talks about one betraying him and Peter denying him, what does he say? Let not your hearts be troubled. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be cowardly. You believe in God. You believe also in me. But as we think about the disciples, you have to realize what did the disciples do? They lived incredible lives. They, again, they were flawed, ordinary individuals. But here's what we know about the disciples. They left businesses to follow Jesus. These same men, they left homes and families to follow Jesus. And these same men left succession plans to do what? Follow the Lord Jesus Christ in life. Now today, let me ask you, whatever age you are, what are you sacrificing in your life to follow Jesus? As he called them to come and to follow him, what, what are you doing to follow him as well in your life? Just common, ordinary, flawed men, but called of the Lord to come and to follow him, and they are obeying the leadership of the Lord. Now, when you think about their sacrifice, we also know that they had short memories. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he says this, believe in God, believe also in me. What is he saying? I want you to trust me. 
What did these men, what were they able to see? Well, you know this. You, they were able to see him feed thousands upon thousands of people. They were able to see him do what? They were able to see him calm a raging storm. They were able to see him also do what? Raise a dead man to life. And so Jesus is saying, based on what you've been able to see, what you know, your relationship with me, I want you to do this. I want you to believe in God, but also believe in me. And then Thomas comes along and he says, now, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And then what does Jesus say? Gives us an incredible statement. He says, what? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, look at number one. I want to just break this passage down, chapter 14, verse 6. Number one, the way we must follow. Now, as I ask you to do that, write this first blank in, ask the right questions. It's going to be important for you and me that if we're going to follow him. We need to ask the right questions. And here's a good question. How does a person go to heaven? One of these days, the Lord Jesus is going to come again, or we're going to breathe our last physical breath. There are two options when it comes to eternity. Heaven with him, hell separated from him. So how do we go to heaven? That's a great, great question. And we're going to give you the answer to that here in just a few moments based on what Jesus says. So we need to ask questions. For example, let me say this. You want to go to Disney World. You and your family, it's a bucket list trip for you. You want to go to Disney World. And so here's what you do. You make a commitment that you're going to go to Disney World. You've bought tickets in Orlando. You're going to go there. So you book an airline from Nashville. You're going to go to Orlando, but you're going to stop in Atlanta. Can you imagine? You're, you're, you've never really been used to flying, but here you are. You get on a plane in Nashville. You find yourself in Atlanta. You end up in Concourse C. I always like Concourse C because there's a Chick-fil-A in Concourse C in Atlanta. And so you're in Concourse C, the Chick-fil-A is there. And so you look at your ticket, you realize you're in the right concourse, but there's no gate. So you don't know if you're to go to gate C-14, C-16, C-21, you just don't know. You see a Delta employee and you say to the employee, we have just left Nashville, we've landed here in Atlanta, we're going to Orlando because we're going to Disney World, can you tell me which gate to go to? And the Delta employee says, you just pick one, you might get to Orlando, you might not get to Orlando, that's just the risk you're going to take. Now we'd say that's absolutely ridiculous, wouldn't we? I mean, tell me the gate you want me to go to that's going to Orlando. I don't want to go to San Diego. I want to go to Orlando. So tell me which gate so I can go to Orlando. We would think that is ridiculous. But here's the scenario. You fly from Nashville. You end up in Atlanta. You see a Delta employee because the gate is not on there. And you ask the employee which gate is going to Orlando. Here's the difference. What if that employee says you're going out of C-14? That will get you to Orlando. You know exactly where you're going. We need to be that clear when it comes to how does a person know Christ, have assurance he or she is going to heaven. Please understand, there are not multiple ways to go to heaven. There's one way to go to heaven. And Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way. And so you don't have to look around and say, well, you just pick a gate and hopefully you'll get to heaven. If you don't, that's a risk you take. You and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can say with certainty, I can tell you how to go to heaven. His name is Jesus. And if you would trust him, he would change your life and give you the assurance you will always be with him for eternity. You just got to ask the right questions. Then look at next, discover the gospel truth. And what does he say here? He goes on to say, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's where we're living at in our world, though. When you look around, you see what Jesus is saying in John 14. You're going to hear people who say, if you'll go to heaven, it's based on do's and don'ts. If you're going to go to heaven, it's based on doing religious deeds. If you're going to go to heaven, it's based on church affiliation. Nowhere in God's word that it says you and I will go to heaven because we do certain things or don't do certain things. Nowhere in God's word does it say that if we do religious deeds, we'll go to heaven. Nowhere in God's word does it say if we're simply affiliated with a church, we'll go to heaven. We go to heaven because we've trusted the Son of God and Savior of the world. His name is Jesus, and he gave his life for you and me. That's how we go to heaven. 
And so when you look at that truth there, we realize, how do we go to heaven? Well, there are believers around the world today in other countries. They are persecuted. They are beaten. They are mistreated. They are prisoned. And even some of them are killed. Why? Not because they're bad people, but because they believe John chapter 14, verse 6. They believe there's one way to go to heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now, church, I hope you understand this, and you do. There are many things in life that consistently change. When it comes to college sports, everything seems to be changing. When it comes to college basketball, everything seems to be changing. I mean, as a Kentucky fan, we don't even have a team. We can't even play a game right now. We don't have any players but three But here's the thing. When I was growing up and you look at college basketball, you made a commitment to the University of Kentucky or the University of Tennessee. You made a commitment. You were going to go to school there. You were going to get an education. You were going to play basketball, football, whatever it may be. And you were going to stay there four years of your life. That's how I was raised. That's how when I watched SEC basketball, football, that's exactly what happened. And then later the system changed. Instead of saying four years, we started recruiting individuals with high talent, but they came and they played one year and they were gone, one and done. Nowadays, here's what happens. You've got somebody who may come one and done, they go pro, or you've got NIL deals, portal situations. So they play for this team this year. They get in the portal and they play for another team next year. They don't like that team. They can make more money over here. So what do they do? They go over there. So the way of college sports changing. But please understand what I'm getting ready to say. When it comes to the way of salvation, nothing has changed. It is still one way to be saved. His name is Jesus. And if you want to go to heaven, you trust him. You surrender your life to him. Again, the methods of what we do change, but the message of what we do, of who we are, never, never changes. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. And so that's what he's saying. He says, I am the way. When it comes to the way, you and I must follow the way, and that is Jesus. Number two. We find the truth we must believe. He says in this passage again, he says, what, I am the way and the truth. But you think about this when it comes to truth. What do we believe about certain things? What do we believe about sports? I mean, as I said, that's changing. I mean, Kentucky, we used to be a basketball school. I'm pretty confident we're a tennis school now. I think we have the number one tennis team maybe in the country, so we're going to pick up tennis now. And so we, we, we're going to lean into that for a while. But what about sports? What do you believe about that? Somebody asks you, what do you believe about global warming? What are you going to say to that? Somebody asks you, what do you believe about the Bible? What are you going to say about the Bible? What we're going to say is God's word. It's an error and it's infallible. It's authoritative. This is the word of God. Genesis to Revelation. Well, what are we going to say about, about salvation? Are there multiple ways to be saved or one way to be saved? There's one way to be saved. It's Jesus. What do we believe about Jesus? Well, here's what we, we believe. He's the son of God. He's the savior of the world. We believe he died on a cross, shed his blood, buried in a tomb. We also believe today that the tomb is empty. Jesus Christ is alive. That's what we believe. Why? Because he is the truth. He's the way that we must follow, but he's the truth and we must believe. Look at number one, truth unites. When you think about the truth, he says in this passage again, I am the truth. Truth unites. Jesus said unites us as brothers and sisters in Christ in our church, but also with believers around the world. But also as you understand this idea of truth, you have to realize there's absolute truth in God's word. And that unites us. What he says here, here's a right way to live, a wrong way to live. These are absolute truths. Here's one of those absolute truths. Whatever you sow, you will also reap. That's an absolute truth. If you sow to the sinful nature, you'll reap destruction. You sow to the spirit, you'll reap eternal life. Whatever you sow, you will reap. You can rest assured your sin will find you out. That's the truth from God's word. So truth unites us. But look at number two, truth divides. But if you want to see division, you start preaching and teaching truth, and you're going to see division happen as well. For example, when you say in our culture that there's one way to go to heaven, and Jesus Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. When you start preaching and teaching that and sharing that, you are swimming against the currents of this culture. 
And sometimes it will bring division. You go to your office and you get all your coworkers around and you say, I want to tell you an amazing, amazing truth straight from the word of God. And you say to your coworkers or maybe some people you're in a university with and you say to them, here's what I believe from God's word, that, that Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, Jesus is the life, and no one goes to heaven except through him. You see how that divides certain relationships. And some people are going to look at you and say, I can't believe it is 2024 and you believe that. You mean then some people are not going to heaven, but they're going to spend eternity in hell. You believe that. And you say, yes, I believe that. There's one way to go to heaven. You trust Christ. You spend eternity in heaven. You reject him and die. You spend eternity in hell. I believe that. And you're going to see how truth sometimes can divide. I'll never forget when I was in seminary, I studied many of the world's religions and here's what they look at. They say, if you're a good person and you do these things and don't do these things and you live a good life, then God's going to accept you and you'll spend eternity with him. Well, when I read the word of God, here's the problem for me, for people, but also for me, I struggle doing good. Anybody witness to that? Because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I remember one day I had a group knock on our door and I always got excited when those people came around our house. They knocked on our door, and I, so they asked me some questions, and I seemed to be interested, and, and they were just salivating because they thought they had a prospect standing in front of them. And so I kind of said, I want to hear more, and here's what they were doing. They were trying to convince me that if you lived a good life and you followed their teaching and their way of life, then you would spend eternity with God. But again, I said, here's the issue I have. And then I turned the conversation. I said, when I look at the word of God and I think about the Jewish laws, there are 613 Jewish laws. Have you all kept every single one of them? They knew the conversation just shifted. And they were a little bit overwhelmed with 613 Jewish laws. I mean, they, they couldn't get that. And I said, well, it looks like it's a little confusing for you. I said, let's narrow it down a little bit more. Let's talk about 10 of them. And I looked at those people standing on our front step and I said, have any of you ever dishonored your father or mother? Quiet. I looked at them again and said, any of you ever stolen anything? A piece of chewing gum, a piece of candy or something more severe? Have you ever stolen anything? Silence. And then I said, have any of you ever, ever told a lie in your life? And I said, here's what the Bible says. If you've broken one command, you've broken them all. And I said, there is no way you're going to be able to keep 613 commandments and Jewish laws. There's no way you're going to keep the 10. But when you look at the 10 commandments, what does it do? It shows us our need for Jesus in life. We can't be good enough. We can't keep all the rules and regulations. We need the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have all sinned. We're not good at being good. We are, our good works are like filthy rags in his sight. We need the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, and thank Jesus he shed his blood on the cross and gave his life that we could be forgiven and saved forever. It's the Lord Jesus. And when you look in John chapter 13 and you see what Jesus is saying here, even under, even under Peter, and here Peter is again, Peter didn't even know himself. How many of us do the same thing? We think we've got life under control. We know ourselves, but, but Peter didn't even know himself because Peter comes along and he says here, he says, Lord, why can't I follow you now in chapter 13? And Peter says this, I will lay down my life for you. Peter also came along and said, listen, Lord, I'll never deny you. I'm going to lay down my life for you. And what does Jesus say? Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Peter thought he knew himself, but he didn't even know himself. But he got exposed to the truth and what Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And what did the truth say to Peter? Peter, you are going to deny me. I wonder how many of us, let's pull back the curtain of life here for a moment. How many of us are ready to face the truth of the Lord Jesus? 
or the way we must follow, but the truth we must believe. How many of us are open to say, Lord, you speak the truth into my life, and I'm ready to hear what the truth is about me? How many of us are there? Oh, if he speaks into us and says, you love me, I can see it in your life. That the scripture says in John 14, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. There's no question you love me because you're obeying everything I ask you to do. Then we'd say, Lord, speak the truth into my life. But what if he came to you and spoke truth into your life and said to you, you don't love me like you did a year ago? What would you say? How many of us came to us and said, I want you to know in your workplace, in your school, in the university, in your neighborhood, maybe other places, I want you to know here's the truth. You are flirting with sin. And he says, sin's not something to flirt with. Sin's not something to play with. Sin is a serious thing. Sin would destroy your life. What would it be like if, we say, if he said that to us? What would it be like if he said to us, he said, when I look at your life, your life is more about you than it is about me. What would we say? If he came to us in relationship to his church, he died and gave his life to the church. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What if he came to you and me and said, when it comes to your participation in the life of my bride, the church, when it comes to the way you serve, the way you give, the way you make your life available, you are doing nothing more but playing church. What would we say? He said to Peter, Peter said, Lord, I'm going to die for you. I'll never deny you. What did he say? Peter, you don't even know yourself. You're going to deny me three times. The truth, absolute truth, written truth, living truth. It is the person of Jesus. Look at the next truth here we see. Not only that, the life that we must live. Are you living the life that he wants you to live? As I shared last week in the message, there are two aspects of life we see in God's word. One of those is eternal life. You give your life to Christ, you trust him, you'll never be lost again. You'll spend eternity with him forever and forever and forever. You shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, as Psalm 23, 6 uh, gives us insight on. So it's eternal life. Second life is abundant life. Abundant life, you know the joy of Christ. Abundant life, you know his purpose for your life. Abundant life, you experience his peace. You experience victories in life, abundant life. You're living free. You're not enslaved or carrying shackles around what you're living a free life because that's who Jesus is. You know the truth. The truth will set you free. That's the abundant life that he's promised. But how do you experience eternal life? How do you experience abundant life? Let me give you these five things. Number one, embrace the gospel. You can experience eternal abundant life today. You embrace the gospel. Again, Jesus went to a cross and gave his life for you. You repent of your sin. You trust him as your savior and you ask him to forgive you and he'll change your life. You embrace the gospel. Number two, you grow in Christ. You don't stay an infant. You grow in Christ. You connect with God's people in his church. You, you, you fill your life with spiritual disciplines in the word, prayer, fasting, praying, journaling, all those. You, you, you're in God's word and he's growing your life, but you grow in Christ. You embrace the gospel and you grow in Christ. Number three, you build strategic relationships. He's never called any of us to live as lone rangers in this life. He's called us in community. He's called us to build relationships. You need godly people in your life who will keep you accountable, who will walk with you, who will help you discover all that God wants you to do, but you build those strategic relationships. Number four, you discover God's will. He has a will for your life. He has a will for your marriage. He has a will for your family. He wants that you to discover his plans and purposes and to live them out. You discover the will of God in your life. And then number five, you live without regrets. You live your life and say, God, I'm not going to come to the end of my physical life on my deathbed and saying, if only, if only, if only I should have done this. No, you live without regrets. And in my pastoral ministry, I've come to the end of life with many, many people, and I can't even begin to count them on my hand, so many who come to the end of life with regrets and said, if I'd only done this, if I'd only done that, but they come with regrets. I just encourage us, don't live your life for money. Don't live your life for pleasure. Don't live your life for sports. Don't live your life for fame. Live your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Live your life for him. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Let me give you an illustration. Last Sunday afternoon, I had a commitment out of town. It was near Memphis. And we were going to drive Sunday afternoon down to Jackson, Tennessee. And then we were going to be in this event with the North American Mission Board on Monday. We drive to Jackson, Tennessee that afternoon, late, early that evening. We stop at a restaurant in Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, we go in. We, we, we didn't orchestrate any of this, but we went in. They seated us in a booth, and we're sitting in this booth. There was a lady who came and said, what would you like to drink? And she said, I'm not serving you, but she talked about this other young person was going to. She went and got her drinks, and finally this young man by the name of Jorge came and started serving us. It was Sunday evening, and I said to him, I said, hey, Jorge, tell me how old you are. And he was 22 years old. I said, Jorge, tell me, have you, have you always lived in Jackson, Tennessee? And he said, I've lived here my entire life. I said, Jorge, have, how long have you worked here? And he told us that. And I said, have you been working all day long? He said, I've been working the lunch shift and now the dinner shift. I said, has it been a good day? And Jorge looked at me and he said, it's been a hard, hard day. And I said, no, Jorge, I'm going to ask you why, but I'm afraid I already know the question, the answer. I said, has it been a hard day because people who got out of church came here and you served them and they were unkind and they did not practice generosity? Has that been the case today? He said, that's the case every Sunday. Church, we're not to build barriers to people. We're to build bridges to people. And so when we go to restaurants today, be kind, be generous. And I said to him, I said, Jorge, here, I promise you this. We're going to be kind to you. We're also going to be generous to you. And so from there, then we kept building this rapport and this relationship. And finally, God opened the door. I talked to him about church, and he hadn't been in church in a long time in his life. And I was able to talk to him about going back to church. And then finally, I was able to transition to talk about the gospel with Jorge standing as he was standing at our table in this restaurant. He was extremely open to the gospel. And here's what happened. I shared some things. I'm going to give them to you in just a moment. I shared them with Jorge. And then I invited Jorge to give his life to the Lord Jesus right here in this restaurant in Jackson, Tennessee. And Jorge said, I want to pray and trust Christ at this very moment. And we stood right there in that restaurant. And Jorge confessed that he had sinned. He understood who Jesus is. And he prayed there at that restaurant and gave his heart and life to Christ and he was born again. Immediately after that, we connected him to a local pastor in Jackson, Tennessee, and to a church. And they immediately made a connection back and forth, introducing one another. And then I said to Jorge, Jorge, do you have a Bible? And he said, not really. I said, here's what I promise you. On Tuesday, we're going to mail you a copy of God's word for you. You need a Bible. You can start growing in your relationship to Christ. We mailed him a Bible on Tuesday. He's got it. And uh, praise the Lord, he's start reading the Bible, get connected to this church, all happen. When I'm having gospel conversations with people, and I pray to have many, many conversations with people, there are always five aspects of those gospel conversations I long to see God do. Sometimes he'll let me go through all five. Sometimes I'll be able to do three and not get to five. But I'm seeking to do five. These are not on the outline. This is just extra stuff. But I want you to know, here's what I did with Jorge the other night, and here's what I try to do every single day of my life as God opens doors. Here are five aspects that I want to walk someone through from an everyday conversation to a gospel conversation. Here's what they are. Number one is God's love. When I looked at Jorge the other night, I said, Jorge, I hope you know how much God loves you. And I quoted, started quoting John 3.16 to him, for God so loved the world. And Jorge started quoting it back. He knew that verse. I said, Jorge, for God so loved the world, you can put your name in that very spot right there. For God so loved Jorge that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting eternal life. I want somebody to know how much Almighty God loves that person. You may have sinned. You may have committed all sorts of stuff in life, but you, God, Almighty God still loves you. The very one who created this day, the very one who created the oceans and the mountains, he loves you. So it's about God's love. Second is our sin. I want them to understand the, the understanding of sin. So I looked at Jorge and I said, Jorge, have you ever sinned in your life? I hardly met anybody who says I've never sinned. That's disobeying God, disappointing him. Jorge was very clear. Yes, I've sinned. 
I said, Jorge, here's the truth of the matter. Every one of us sitting at this table, we have sinned against God. That's what Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says. We have sinned against him. That's every single one of us. But God loves you. We have all sinned against him. Number three, I want him to jizz his life. And then I want to communicate about the life of the Lord Jesus. And I said to him, I said, Jorge, here's what I can tell you about the Lord Jesus. He left heaven and he was born in a city called Bethlehem. He took on human flesh. But here's what was different about Jesus' life than your life and my life. He never sinned. He lived a perfect, sinless life. But Jorge, here's how amazing the love of God is that because we've sinned, Jesus Christ lived a perfect sinless life, but he went to Calvary's cross. Nails pierced his hands and feet. A crown of thorns pressed over his head. A sword pierced his side. He shed his blood for your sin and for my sin. They put him in a borrowed tomb, but three days later, Easter morning, Resurrection Sunday, the tomb was empty. Jesus Christ is alive. And I said, Hori, I want you to know the life of the Lord Jesus, that he lived his life and he died on a cross victorious over the grave. Why? Because he loves you. You sinned against him and he wants to change your life. So again, God's love, our sin, Jesus' life, number four, is a glorious promise. You say, what is the promise? It's Romans chapter 10, verse 13. I said, Jorge, here is the promise. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jorge, I didn't make that verse up. I didn't write that verse. The Holy Spirit gave inspiration to that. Whoever, that's you, Jorge, that's me, that's whoever's in this restaurant, calls on the name of the Lord. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not do's and don'ts, not religious deeds, not church affiliation. Jesus Christ, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Jorge, that's not from an accident. That's not falling out of a tree. That is passing from spiritual death to spiritual life. Jesus is the only one who will save you. All this happening in this restaurant. And then number five, as I come here, it's just an unpressured invitation. And I just said to him, Jorge, I'm not trying to pressure you. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm not trying to force you. But whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that means right here at this table in this restaurant, if you'll call on the name of the Lord, he will save you. It's an unpressured invitation. Jesus invited people to make decisions. And I just invited him right there in that restaurant to give his life to Christ. And Jorge said, I want to trust the Lord. He gave his life to Christ. You know why? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God's love, our sin, Jesus' life, glorious promise, and unpressured invitation. I want to ask you in this room or those who are watching, I want you to know how much Almighty God loves you. I want you to know all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I want you to know the life of Jesus, perfect sinless life, crucifixion on a cross, buried in a tomb, gloriously raised. Three days later, the tomb is empty. Jesus Christ is alive, and one day he's coming again. But I want you to get this glorious promise. If you, if you, if you, if you, wherever you are watching, whatever it may be, if you will call on the name of the Lord, here is this incredible promise. He will save you. He'll redeem you. He'll forgive you. He'll change your life. You can have eternal life, abundant life. He'll save you and change you. But I also want to give you this unpressured invitation. And we're going to invite you to give your life to Christ today in the room or those who are watching. Turn from your sin. Trust Jesus to be your Savior. Surrender your life to him. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash away my sins. Don't trust your good deeds. Don't trust religious deeds. Don't even trust church affiliation. Give your life to Jesus and let him save you. Why? Because no one comes to the Father except through him. So I want us to bow our heads together. and Here's where the invitation is. The invitation is from your heart to God's heart that you would say yes to the Holy Spirit's leadership. 
If he's convicting you today about your need for a relationship to Christ, you say, listen, I, I'm right there where Jorge was at. I know some things. I've been in church years ago. I hadn't read the Bible in a long time, but I know God loves me. I know I've sinned against him. I am thankful for the life of Jesus. I understand that promise that if I call in his name, I'll be saved. And I want to obey his invitation this morning to say yes to Jesus in my life. Is that you? Our pastoral team's going to be here. We're inviting you to come to Jesus, not simply come to us. We just want to celebrate with you or help you from God's word how to be saved. Come to Jesus. Trust him. You need to be baptized. You want to join the fellowship of this church. God's calling you into ministry. There's sin in your life. Or you just say, I am lost. I am desperate to be saved. And I can't wait to get saved next week. I need to be saved right now. He'll save you at this very moment. Come to him. Now, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying, giving your life for us. Thank you for being victorious over the grave. Thank you for the invitation today to trust you as our Savior. And so, Father, as we stand in just a moment and sing, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move and there would be people who say yes to Jesus for the first time or make other spiritual decisions. Those who are watching online, they'd respond to us and to say, I just gave my life to Christ. I just trusted him or I just made another spiritual decision. Oh, Lord Jesus, move in our midst, we pray. And thank you that when we come to you, we leave changed because that's who you are, Lord Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, I lift you up. Thank you for the movement of the Holy Spirit. And we ask people to come to you and let us serve them and help them know you and follow you and love you. And I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a new horizon And I'm set on you that I knew all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you it's a new horizon and I'm set on wonderful day today. There is only one way, and that way is through Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And just because the service is over does not mean the invitation to respond is. If you have any questions about anything, please email us. Someone on our staff will respond to you. Well, we want to say thank you again for watching online this week. Share today's service with someone you love. And speaking of love, we love you, church. And we'll see you next week.